Now that we've been introduced to the idea of grammar of data wrangling, let's start applying these functions to a single data frame. So we're going to assume that what we have is a single data frame and we want to slice it, dice it, juice it and process it. Um, we're going to continue working with the hotels booking data set. So once again, we have data from two hotels, a resort and a city hotel, and each observation is a uh, represents a hotel booking here. We're going to first look at the uh, verbs or functions, select, arrange, and slice. So we can use select to keep variables. So in this case, I'm selecting the variables called hotel and lead time from the hotel's data frame. Or we can also use select to exclude variables. One of the variables in the data set was agent, so the uh, type of agent that did the booking. Um, and so we can say, give me all of the columns except for agent. And for that, we're using the minus sign. And so you can see that the number of columns is now reduced to 31 from 32, which was the full data set. We can also select a range of variables. This requires that you know the order in which the variables in your data set appear. But with the colon operator, what we're basically saying is give me all of the variables between the hotel variable and the arrival date month variable. So that happens to be the first five columns of our data set. So that's what we're seeing as a result here. Um, that's not always a useful way of selecting things because it requires that you know where your variables appear in your data frame or that they were placed in a sensible way. And that may not always be true, especially if you were not the person who prepared the data set. So something a little bit more handy is to select variables uh, with certain characteristics in their names. So here what we're saying is select all of the variables that start with the word arrival. So in this case, we have arrival date year, arrival date month, and arrival date uh, week. So that's the week in the year that we're talking about. Um, so, and we have one more actually, arrival date day of month. So that's going to give you a number between one and 31. Um, there we can another way of selecting instead of starts with we can do ends with so here I'm looking at all of the variables that end with the character string type so these are things like reserved room type assigned room type so these letters in the observations here mean something it's a reservation code deposit type customer type so these are the four variables among the 32 that we started with that end with the word type. What these um, basically tell us is that if you're the person putting together the data set, or even if somebody else passed on the data set to you, the first thing you might want to do is to name your variables sensibly so that you can easily access them with these types of selectors. And here's a list of the selectors. Uh, we have we talked about starts with and ends with. We can also say contains a literal string, so it could appear anywhere in the variable name. It could be a number range, so this is especially helpful if you have something like time series data where each column perhaps is a year or has some date or some number of the observation that you are uh, that is stored in that column one of matches a variable names in a character vector so it's kind of like saying is any of these present um, everything matches all of the variables this is helpful for saying for example select a list of certain variables and then give me everything else. That's useful when what you want to do actually is to reorder the variables in your data frame as opposed to select some in or out. Last call happens to be the last variable and you can actually add an offset to it to say second to last, third to last. And then finally, you can use a matches operator, which matches a, what we call a regular expression. We're not going to go into the details of a regular expression just yet. That's going to come up later in the course. But very briefly, that's a sequence of symbols and characters expressing a string or a pattern to be searched for within the text. So if you don't have a um, your variables nicely named where you can do things like starts with arrival or ends with type, uh, but you want to be more permissive about the types of things that are selected, say something like 
ends with any of the following letters or something like that, um, then you may want to actually use a regular expression as opposed to a literal character string to match by. So once we learn more about regular expressions, that particular select uh, helper might be useful for you as well. You can look for the help for any one of these. So I just happen to pick everything here and then it will give you within a single help file information on e all of them in one place. And I find that really handy because sometimes it's hard to tell which one you need as you're looking for something. You're just thinking, I want to select this set of variables. I know how to do that, but I'm not sure which one of these functions is going to be the easiest way to go about it. So just pull up the help for any one of them and then start thinking through them and reviewing the examples at the bottom. Uh, arrange is another word. Uh, verb that we've seen already, uh, which basically allows us to reorder rows. So this is instead of working with columns, it's reordering rows. So here what I've done is I have selected the variables adults, children, and babies. So that's the number of uh, uh, adults, children, and babies in a given booking. And then I've arranged by babies. So the number of babies. Arrange by default will put things in increasing ascending order. So here, for example, is a booking with two adults, zero children, and zero babies. Seems pretty normal. How about we go the other way? Um, we say, again, let's select adults, children, and babies, but then arrange in descending order of babies. Here's a booking with two adults and 10 babies. You don't want to be next door to that, I suppose. Here's a booking with one adult and nine babies. I don't really know what's happening in that room either. Um, we can also select slice for certain row numbers. So here, for example, I'm saying, give me the first five. So uh, slice one through five basically gives you the first five rows of your data frame. It's usually useful for inspection to see what's happening there. Um, and in R, note that we can use the uh, the hashtag symbol for adding comments to our code. So any text following that will be printed as is and won't be run as our code. It's useful for leaving comments in your code and also for temporarily disabling certain lines of code while you're doing debugging. I recommend once you say I am done with the code, you remove um, any sort of comments for um, used for kind of disabling code, but you can act obviously leave comments that are more in prose form to leave yourself notes or leave the next person reading your code some notes. So here I had started with the hotel's data frame and I had initially selected just the hotel variable, but by commenting this out, I'm saying this line is not going to run. So it's almost like I never typed it. And now I'm saying slice one through five. So give me uh, all of the uh, columns, but only rows one through five. Um, slicing the data frame like this can be helpful for inspecting, but oftentimes we want to actually look for rows with certain characteristics. And for that, we use filter. So for example, if I want to say, give me the bookings in city hotels, I would say filter for where hotel is equal to city hotel. This gives me a data frame with 32 columns, so all of the columns I had to begin with, but only 79,330 rows. So out of the total of 119,390, this is how many uh, bookings we have in city hotels. So filter is the function, and then within the filter function, we are giving it some sort of a logical uh, um, statement. So a test to see if hotel is equal to city hotel, report it back to me. If it's not, then I don't want to hear about it. Um, we can also filter for many conditions at once. So here I'm saying filter for where adults are equal to zero and children are greater than or equal to one, which is a little bit weird, just children in a hotel room, but it might be one of these things where you have like two adjoining rooms uh, where the children are staying in one room and adults in the other room, but there's actually a door in between them, for example, as opposed to just kids booking hotel rooms for themselves. So here, for example, we can see there are uh, 223 hotel bookings where we have just children in the room, but no adults. 
Some of these might have babies as well, and some of these may not. The top six rows that we're inspecting here don't happen to have babies in them. But here to say filter for both of these conditions, I've basically used a comma to say adults is equal to zero and children is greater than or equal to one. Um, we can also do more complex conditions. So here what I'm saying is either I want, uh, I want adults equal to zero, that's for sure, and I want one of two things. Either children is greater than or equal to one, or babies is greater than or equal to one. So um, here we can have rows where either children is greater than or equal to one or baby is greater than or equal to one. Um, so there are 223 such rows that gives me that. The OR operator is the straight line, um, kind of the straight vertical line that uh, in R. So we've now introduced a double equal, a greater than or equal to, and an OR operator with a straight vertical line. And so here's a list of the logical operators that you should be familiar with. Some of them are very self-explanatory and some of them might look quite bizarre in the first instance. Less than means less than. Uh, less than or equal to, we don't wanna have a single uh, kind of keystroke for that, like a special character. So we do the less than sign and then equal to to say less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, we use the double equals to say it's exactly equal to. So we don't wanna use a single equal here because we're not setting one thing equal to another. We're testing to see are they equal. And for not equal to, we use the exclamation point. So the exclamation point in R basically gives us not. Um, the end operator is basically the ampersand sign. So when we were doing that, those filters and we were saying adults is equal to zero and children are equal to zero, I use a comma because the filter function will take multiple arguments like that. But I could have also used the end operator as well. Um, the straight vertical line is the or operator. So X or Y is true. And then, um, NAs are special snowflakes, and we're going to say more about them when we formally talk about data types and classes in R. But if you're looking to see if something is an NA, so a not available, then we can actually say, is it equal to NA with a double equal sign, but we need to use the is.NA operator or exclamation point is.NA to say, is it not NA? Um, the in operator tests to see if any element in X happens in Y. And if we want to negate that, we would then put the exclamation point outside of that. So the exclamation point in general gives us not something. Um, don't worry about memorizing each and every one of these. At no point in this class will you be asked on the spot to kind of report back on one of these. Every assessment we're doing is basically open book, but note that there are these variety of options. So next time you're doing a filter statement or something else that needs a logical operator, and you can't quite remember how to test for that particular uh, uh, condition that you're looking for, come back to this slide. So what I would uh, recommend that you do right now is pause the video and go fire up our Studio Cloud and start working on the application exercise number four, which is hotels and data wrangling, but only exercises one through four for now. These are going to give you some practice with the dplyr verbs we've covered so far. And then I would recommend come back and continue where we left things off. I'll give you a second to do that now. All right, next up, we're going to talk about distinct and count functions. So distinct gives us, uh, the, we, we use a distinct function to filter for unique rows. Um, so there is, for example, a variable called market segment. So which market segment the booking came from? And I might be curious to see, I wonder what all the market segments that are represented in almost 120,000 rows of my data set are. So I can say in the hotels data frame, give me the distinct values of market segment, and I'll just arrange them in the order of market segment as well so that they are given to me in alphabetical order. So some of them might be coming from the aviation 
aviation industry. So this is probably uh, pilots and other flight staff making bookings for hotels. Um, some of them are complimentary, some of them are corporate bookings, direct bookings, so on and so forth. Uh, we can then, since we can uh, kind of chain things along, use basically the uh, pipe operator to do this alphabetical ordering. Another thing we can do is to look for distinct pairs or distinct combinations of any variables. So the distinct function takes on multiple uh, variables or multiple arguments, if you like. So here I'm saying, give me the distinct combinations of hotel type and market segment. So I can see, for example, that in uh, city hotels, these are the eight possible market segments that appeared. And again, I said, uh, arrange the results for me in the order of hotel first. So that's why city C comes before resort R, uh, and then by the market segment uh, label. Count. Uh, basically first takes the distinct observations in the data frame and then calculates summary statistics, specifically the number of observations for that particular level of your variable. So instead of doing distinct market segment, if I say count market segment, it will give me the distinct values and then it will also give me the number of observations in my data frame that belong to that type of uh, the distinct value of that particular variable. So I can see here that 237 of the bookings were from aviation, 743 were complementary, so on and so forth. By default, the count function will give you the results in order of alphabetical order for the levels of the variable that you're counting. Um, I might want actually to change things out so things aren't in alphabetical order, but instead in order of this new uh, frequency variable, the n variable that gets constructed when we call the count function. And since this is such a common task, the count function actually offers an argument to get that by default. So the sort equals true argument in count will give you the same data frame, but this time we have sorted it by, um, we've sorted it by the magnitude of n, the frequencies in descending order. So online bookings were the highest, um, most frequent observations in this data set. Um, count and arrange could basically give you um, the same thing as that sort equals true argument. So this slide is just exemplifying the fact that there are multiple ways of getting to the same output. So here, what I've done is I've started with the hotels data frame, counted the various types of market segments, and then if I arrange things in order of n, it will give them to me in ascending, so increasing order of n. But if I use that desk function for descending, um, then I get the same output as if I had set sort equals true in the count function. So my personal preference when I want things um, ordered a certain way in descending order for the count is to add the sort equals uh, true argument to it directly as opposed to writing one more line of code, but it is just a matter of personal preference and you should do whichever one feels better for you. Uh, we can also count for multiple variables. So just like we could do distinct that way, we can do count as well. And so what this does is it gives me the combinations of the, uh, or the frequencies for the combinations of hotel type and market segment. So 237 uh, bookings for aviation within city hotels, and it looks like none in resort hotels. And maybe that makes sense when um, flight staff are staying in um, the in uh, hotels, maybe they happen to choose city hotels as opposed to resort hotels. Um, when we're using the count function, the order in which you provide these variables matters. And it matters not for what is being counted, but for the order in which the results are being displayed to you. So if I say count the hotels, and then within each hotel, the various market segments, you can see that my output will be organized by hotel first, and then market segment. But if I say count the various market segments, and then within each of the market segments, tell me how many observations per each hotel, 
then it's organ the output is organized by market segment first and then I can see uh, for a given market segment how many are in city hotels and how many are in resort hotels. So if you look at the N columns for these two pieces of output, you'll be able to do the numbers matching, uh, but the order in which they're presented um, is different. So this is another great time to take a break from the video, go back to our Studio Cloud and work on exercises five and six from the hotels and data wrangling application exercise, and then come back for the rest of the video. Next up is the mutate function. And remember that all dplyr functions operate on data frames. So here what we're mutating is the data frame. We can mutate a data frame to add a new variable. Here I'm creating a new variable called little ones, which will take the value of the sum of the number of children and the number of babies in the hotel room. I know that it's going to be a new variable because um, there was no such variable in the data set to begin with. So I am mutating the date hotels data frame to create a new variable called little ones. And then I can basically write an expression by which I want to calculate that. In this case, it happens to be a simple addition. And then just so things fit nicely on my slides, I'm going to just select the three very relevant variables, children, babies, and little ones to check my calculations. And then um, we're going to arrange in descending order of little ones to see what is the most number of little ones we might be able to find in one of these bookings. So here's a row, uh, an observation with 10 children and zero babies resulting in 10 little ones. Okay. And another one with zero children and 10 babies resulting in again, 10 little ones. You probably don't want to be stuck next to and either of these hotel rooms if they're re real and another one with zero children and nine babies. These particular rows might be something funny going on in these hotel rooms or perhaps more likely they are data errors that are worth investigating further. The rest of them seem a bit more reasonable, things like two children and one baby resulting in three little ones in a hotel room. Uh, makes a little bit more sense. Now what we might be curious about is, do there tend to be more um, children in um, resort hotels or city hotels. So after we do the mutate step uh, to cal calculate the little ones variable, we can pipe this into a filter statement. And I have on two sides of the slide here, two separate um, uh, filter statements. One is looking for a little ones greater than or equal to one, but where hotel is equal to resort hotel. And the other one, again, looking for little ones greater than or equal to one, but the hotel is equal to a city hotel. And just for displaying purposes, I've only selected the hotel and the little ones variables. And I can see that in resort hotels, it's uh, 3,929 uh, bookings have some little ones associated with them. And in the city hotels, 5,403. Now, based on these variables, we can say that in this data set, there are more uh, bookings for city hotels uh, where there are little ones in the room. But that is not to say if people have kids, they're more likely to book a city hotel because remember that the number of observations for resort and city hotels are not equal. So when we're ca uh, comparing these raw counts, we very well might be comparing the fact that there were simply more bookings in city hotels to begin with. Um, so what's happening in this following chunk? We created uh, the little ones variable again with mutate. And then what I've done is once we have created that, I have counted the various combinations of hotel type and little ones. So basically this is telling me that for city hotels, the possibilities were zero little ones, only one child or little one, two, three or nine or 10 that we'd seen before. And in resort hotels, the options are zero, one, two, three, and then there's a 10. And then for each one of these combinations, um, the count function basically will give me the N, which is the frequency that falls into that bucket. So again, I'm building up on this pipeline to do another mutate step where I say the proportion is now going to be um, the value of the N 
divided by the sum of all of the n's. So what this basically tells me is um, of, the, of all of the rows in my data set, what percent does this number 73,923 constitute or what percent does this number 36,131 constitute? So again, this is an example of building up on your pipeline by mixing and matching between these functions uh, to get the results that you desire. Um, the next bit we're going to talk about is going further into calculating summary statistics like we did in the uh, previous step, but this time transforming the entire data frame. So for this, we're going to use the summarize and then sometimes summarize and group by functions in conjunction with each other. For example, uh, the uh, variable ADR is the average daily rate. So uh, when you do a hotel booking, Every single night of that booking may not necessarily cost you the same amount. For example, if you have a hotel booking that spends a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, the Saturday and Sunday rates might be higher than Monday and Tuesday. But in this data set, we don't have that distinction we only know the total amount you paid and the number of nights that you stayed. Uh, therefore, we divide the total by the number of nights to get the mean, uh, to get the average daily rate. So that's basically saying for a particular booking, what was the average daily rate is a value we have reported for us in our data set. And what we might want to do is to further summarize that number to say, of all of these 119,000 records, uh, what is the mean average daily rate for all bookings in this particular city spanning both city and resort hotels? So we have we take our entire data set and we're basically collapsing it down to a single number, the mean average daily rate. We can do this using the summarize function. And so when we use the summarize function, first we need to give a name for the summary statistic that we want to calculate, and then we give the mathematical expression by which we want to calculate it. So in this case, I'm saying take the ADR variable, which was the average daily rate variable we have recorded for each booking, and then find the mean of that. So it seems like $102 is the mean average daily rate for all bookings in this data set. Um, so summarize changes the data frame entirely. It collapses rows down to a single summary statistic and removes all of the columns that are irrelevant to the calculation, which means you want to use it. Um, you obviously want to use it when you need to, but you probably don't want to write over the initial hotels data frame that you do. If we were to save this result as something else, we would want to save it as a new separate object. Um, summarize actually lets you get away with being sloppy and not naming your new column or your new uh, summary statistic, but I don't recommend that. So even though R would let you get away with this statement and would just basically uh, quote the expression that you give it um, because you're not allowed to have things like um, parentheses in a uh, variable name, uh, it would put it in quotes and say, okay, this is the character string for the name of your variable. I recommend against it, always think about what you wanna name your summary statistic, make it concise, but also informative. So I didn't wanna name this just mean because mean is a function in R and um, I wanted to be more explicit about what it is the mean of. Um, the next thing that you might want to do once you start doing data summaries is actually looking at group summaries. So instead of finding the mean average daily rate for this entire data set, since we know that there are two distinct types of hotels here, we may actually want to find that for the two separate um, hotels. So what I would do is I would stick in a new uh, layer in my pipeline basically saying, first take the hotels data set and group by hotel, and then do the next calculation for each level of the hotel variable. So what group by does is it says for everything coming after me, do the calculations um, X many times, so in this case twice, for each level of the variable by which the data is grouped. So in city hotels, the mean average daily rate is $105, and in resort hotels, that value is $95. 
Um, we can use actually summarize to calculate frequencies as well, which we were already able to do with the count function. But here is another uh, slide that exemplifies there are multiple ways of getting to the same answer. So I could say take the hotel's data frame, group by hotel, and then summarize for me. And what I'm what I want the summary statistic that I want for each um, level of the hotel variable is the number of uh, occurrences, so frequency of that level. So the function n basically gives me that. And just to make things super complicated, I am then naming this variable n as well, which is something we commonly used for indicating frequency in statistics and data science. But this is starting to get a little bit um, kind of difficult to read or you need to do a lot more to kind of keep things in mind. But note that the uh, parentheses always follow a function. So here n is being given as a function and here as the label for the variable. And so this would give me the occurrences, but I can simply get to this using the count function as well. So count is basically a shortcut for doing group by and then summarize. We can also use summarize to calculate multiple summary statistics. So here, in addition to calculating the mean average daily rate, I'm also calculating the minimum, the median, and the maximum as well. So these are all our functions uh, that are defined, um, min, min, mean, median, and max. And on the other side, I am giving these informative labels or names for what these summary statistics are going to be represented as in my data frame. So the resulting data frame, again, has only one row because um, we're basically collapsing our data into a single row, but it has multiple columns, one for each of the summary statistics that I wanted to calculate. So the minimum average daily rate is negative 6.38, it doesn't really make sense. You get paid for staying there, but maybe there was like a refund situation happening. And then the maximum is 5,400. So that is one expensive hotel room, but you know, it is possible. And the mean we already had seen that it's 102 and the median is uh, $94.60. So now that we've wrapped up this video, I would recommend that you go back to that application exercise. That's the fourth one called Hotels and Data Wrangling and finish it up by working on exercises seven and eight that are going to ha have you use some functions from the last bit of the video.